Hello there guys, and we are back with another Paleo Profile. And we've covered weird bear trap fish, lizard sloths, and armadillo crocs. So today, let's discuss some of the normal animals from Earth's past. Giant sea scorpions. I'm done. That's right, we are going to examine the famous and incredibly creepy sea scorpions of Earth's past. The Eurypterids, and find out just how strange they got. So I hope you like creepy crawlies, because this is Paleo Profile Eurypterids. Most paleo fans have heard of these guys, but normally they pretty much know nothing about them, other than they looked like big scorpions and were creepy looking. From the time fish began to develop their jaws to just before the reign of the dinosaurs, these guys dominated Earth's salt and freshwater ecosystems and gave way to the largest arthropods in Earth's history. They were the Eurypterids, also known as sea scorpions for all you unprofessionals out there. I'm so alone. Eurypterids were a very long-lasting, incredibly diverse group of arthropods that existed on Earth from the Ordovician to the end of the Permian. They could range in size from small enough to fit into the palm of your hand to long enough to be the size of an alligator. They were so weird it's often difficult to accept that organisms this large and this alien-like once existed. Eurypterids have their origins possibly as far back as the Cambrian, as they are likely descended from some of the first animals to walk on land, such as protognites. Suck it, vertebrates. Their independent ancestry and evolution from us backboned internal skeleton minorities have resulted in them exhibiting many interesting traits of modern arthropods, such as ants and crabs, but on steroids. As arthropods, they possessed a tough exoskeleton, just like crustaceans, insects, and one of their closest living relatives, arachnids. They often possess ten limbs, eight for walking and capturing prey, and two to be used as paddles for propulsion. Some could use these two paddle-like legs as, well, paddles in a rowing locomotion much like a boat. At the end of their body was a long and flexible tail called a telson, which often possessed a spine on its tip, although some Eurypterids possessed a tail-like fluke instead. Underneath their body in the center was one gaping mouth which the limbs brought food to. Eurypterids also had more than just two eyes. Hey, don't judge, you once had three. They possessed two large binocular compound eyes on the top of their heads, and in between these two larger eyes were two smaller ones called a celli. This is unlike their scorpion relatives, who do in fact also have two larger eyes on the top, but instead have their numerous smaller eyes near the front of their bodies close to the pinchers. Eurypterids' closest relatives are even more extravagant, possessing a grand total of seven eyes throughout their bodies. Eurypterids' bodies most resemble that of modern scorpions, but in contrary to their names, Eurypterids aren't scorpions at all and are only distantly related to them. Yes, as it turns out, these sea scorpions aren't even scorpions. According to most cladistics, Eurypterids' closest relatives are horseshoe crabs, which have a more compact body plan. Arachnids such as scorpions and spiders are closely related to Eurypterids, but most studies suggest they are closer related to horseshoe crabs, which have survived since the Ordovician period, far outlasting their scorpion-esque brethren. The stinger-like tails of Eurypterids, called telsons, are actually homologous to those found on modern horseshoe crabs. In reality, most arthropods still have this tail-like appendage, which has diversified to evolve into many different uses, from tail fins and shrimp and crabs, to ironically enough, the stinger of a scorpion, to the whip-like sensory organ found in whip Scorpions. It appears scorpions are closer related to spiders and other arachnids than they do to eurypterids. Therefore, their close appearance seems to be convergent evolution. The thing is, scorpions and other arachnids, like spiders, resemble eurypterids so much, sometimes arachnids are mistaken to be eurypterids, and eurypterids are sometimes mistaken to be arachnids. Nevertheless, they are distinctly different from one another, and you can often distinguish between the two if you know what to look for. One of the biggest identifiers is the legs. Generally, Eurypterids have shorter limbs, ending in a single claw, instead of the two toes like those found in modern and extinct scorpions. Eurypterid legs normally are more paddle-like due to their much more marine and aquatic life. Unlike scorpions, very few Eurypterids had adapted to walk on land, and when they did, they lumbered about by dragging their bodies in the mud, while scorpions were much more adapted to life on land with longer and thinner legs that carried their bodies above the ground. Another identifier is their telsons, or tail region. Eurypterids had venomless tails that were used more for locomotion and steering underwater. Scorpion tails are more often used for the offensive and defensive as weapons that inject venom into their prey. The last identifier is the fact scorpions tend to be smaller than Eurypterids. Due to their aquatic environment, Eurypterids were capable of reaching larger sizes than their terrestrial cousins, although some scorpions were able to rival their aquatic kin in size during the Carboniferous. 
Despite these differences, it is interesting that these two distinct groups evolved to resemble one another. One group simply became more specialized for life on land, while the other was more specialized for life onto water. There was actually a very decent amount of overlap when these scorpion imposters coexisted along their true scorpion cousins. I guess Eurypterids came first, so it would be true Eurypterids alongside Eurypterid imposters. We should probably call our modern scorpions land Eurypterids, instead of us calling Eurypterid sea scorpions. Huh. Fights between Brontoscorpio, a true scorpion, and Pterygotus, a Eurypterid, most likely could have happened. Like all arthropods, Eurypterids had to molt their exoskeletons in order to grow. They would shed their outer shell and grow a new one. This process has been seen in modern arthropods, some of them very large, but watching an 8 foot long Eurypterid shed its skin would truly be a spectacle. Sometimes, enormous mounds of molted exoskeletons from many individuals, such as Eurypterus, are found on now fossilized beaches. These mass gatherings have been interpreted as mass mating and molting sites, where Eurypterids from all over the ocean would migrate to a safe beach shore, away from predators in great numbers to mate, lay eggs, and then molt their exoskeletons and then leave their young to grow. This behavior is incredibly similar to that of modern horseshoe crabs, who also host massive reunions on shore areas in order to mate, lay eggs, and then molt their skin, again leaving their young to grow. On certain nights during the Silurian, Devonian, Ordovician, or Carboniferous, one could watch hundreds if not thousands of these sea scorpions scuttling across the beach, piled on top of one another, just like their modern relatives. Eurypterids are interesting simply due to the true diversity of them as a whole. The thing is, again, in contradictory to their name, they weren't restricted to living in the sea. They existed both in fresh water and salt water, occupying many different roles. Some were massive super predators, the largest in the early seas with powerful crushing claws. Others were gentle giants, spending more time in swamps and streams, sifting through the mud for tiny invertebrates. Others still possessed spiky spines on their forelimbs, used to impale early fish. And others still were stingray-like swimmers, scavenging in the primitive reefs. The thing is, they weren't scorpions, and not all of them lived in the sea. A considerable amount of them lived in freshwater streams, swamps, and rivers. Brilliant job, science. Even a few Eurypterids even started to colonize the land, and they will be the highlight for the rest of this episode. Instead of highlighting some of the well-known ones, I thought I would like to highlight one of the very obscure yet fascinating members of Eurypterid, the Carboniferous Sea Scorpion, which was neither a scorpion nor lived in the sea, so meh. Hibbertop Terrace, or as I like to call it, the Armored Walking Manatee. During the time of the worldwide swamps, increased oxygen levels, and supersized insects, a group of Eurypterids broke off from their primarily aquatic relatives and began to settle the land. Stylonoria had developed increasingly more robust and stout limbs used for walking on terrestrial soil, much like those of modern land crabs. In contrast to their water-dwelling cousins, whose limbs were weak and only used for crawling on the sea bottom, they evolved to the point they lost swimming legs entirely. Eventually, members of Stylonoria took advantage of their dry environment-suited legs and diversified into many different amphibious niches in the Carboniferous swamps, growing to large sizes, coexisting alongside just as large true scorpion rivals. Eurypterids like Mega Eurachne might have resembled a cat-sized spider, and was in fact once mistaken for one. But the largest and truly most bizarre of the Carboniferous Eurypterids, Hibertop Terrace. In what is now Scotland, a massive six meter long track, a meter across, was discovered in the Carboniferous mud. The animal exhibited a lumbering and dragging motion through the soil. These tracks would later be identified as those of a gargantuan arthropod, five feet long and three feet across. Subsequent fossils display that this animal possessed a head shield that vaguely resembled a human face. Its body was, well, fat, and it might have looked like a massive scuttling Zoidberg. So I guess like Zoidberg. It dragged its heavy body across the muck with strong and robust legs, dragging its scorpion-esque tail. It was so strange Hibbertop Terrace was first believed to be an entirely unrelated croup to Eurypterid, until further studies showed that this weirdo was in fact a sea scorpion. Despite its scary appearance, it was relatively harmless and only fed on small invertebrates by filtering them out of the soft sediment with blade-like claws. Most of the time, one would see them resting in the streams and rivers, like boulders with legs. Such an animal would be a spectacle to see moving around on land, moving like a sea turtle yet looking like a cow-sized horseshoe crab. I for one think that there's just something magical about giant, shark-sized, crab-like scorpions that come in hundreds of shapes and sizes. Imagine swimming with Eurypterids, or holding ones the size of cats. Someone has to draw a pet Eurypterid. Get on it, artist. I guess? Well, I digress. Eurypterids dominated Earth's ecosystems during the Paleozoic, some preying on our fish and then amphibian ancestors, frequently taking the roles of what we consider to be traditionally vertebrate niches. 
They were so successful at preying on vertebrates that it is likely that early fish-like placoderms evolved thick armor plating to defend themselves from the pinchers of these crab-like predators. It wasn't until the Permian when these organisms began to decline, and the Permian mass extinction put a final nail on the coffin of these arthropods. Pop culture crap. Eurypterids have made, a um, meh? Impact on pop culture, one of the most famous and, in my opinion, best depictions has been in the BBC Walking With series. In Walking With Monsters, the massive Eurypterid Terry Gotis is briefly seen, living alongside its true scorpion relative, Bronto Scorpio. In Chase by Sea Monsters, Eurypterids get much more attention as Megaloraptus is seen throughout the episode as predators with very damaging weapons that are able to tear animals to shreds. The episode even ends by displaying a mass mating and molting gathering, just as some fossils have proven. Both depictions look great accuracy-wise, and they look amazing as models and CGI effects. Sometimes they really look like they are alive. One nitpick of mine is that the sea scorpions in the BBC documentaries don't have the eye spots in the center of their heads as they did in life. Terry Gotis is depicted caring for its young. I'm not sure if we have any evidence to prove this. As said before, most Eurypterids reproduce much like horseshoe crabs, coming to shore in large numbers, reproducing, molting their exoskeletons, abandoning their young in the process. It's possible some Eurypterids might have deviated from this, though. Later in Walking with Monsters, they depict a giant predatory carboniferous spider simply referred to as Mesothele. Interestingly, this spider was originally supposed to be a Eurypterid by the name of Megarachne that, at the time of the show's production, was misinterpreted as a big spider. The show last minute had to change the name as it was too far in production to change the design and storyboards. The real animal looked like this and was less a spider, more of a scorpion. Or, sea scorpion. Another interesting pop culture appearance of Eurypterids is that of Pokemon. Kabutops, which is a fossil Pokemon, is somewhat inspired by Eurypterids, possessing cool sickle-like claws and a bipedal stance. It evolved from a trilobite-inspired one, Kabuto. Eurypterids in reality did not evolve from trilobites, they are virtually unrelated. Eurypterids have been seen as minor characters in many other prehistoric thingies, but never in great or notable extent. Nevertheless, in my opinion, Eurypterids are one of the most interesting groups throughout all of Earth's history. These big bugs would have ruled the world if it wasn't for that pesky mass extinction. Our success as vertebrates owes itself to the extinction of these guys. So next time when you're bored and feeling down, just remember your ancestors used to cower in fear from giant scorpions that really weren't scorpions. Thanks for watching. Suck it, vertebrates.